Alrighty guys, well, we have Palliative Care 101. Um, so I feel like a lot of people could teach the Palliative Care 205 course or even the PhD. Um, so we're gonna kind of keep it pretty basic um, and just jump in when you guys feel like it. If you guys do something different, um, if you guys have different things to add, just jump in. We're gonna try to keep it really interactive. So what we have planned is three cases uh, and we've kind of divided up the cases uh, around symptom clusters, and so we'll be focusing on dyspnea. So Elisa and I will be focusing on dyspnea. So without further ado, we really wanted to cover the difference between the palliative role and the hospice care role you might encounter in dyspneic patients, how you might manage that dyspnea in those patients, and then, of course, we always have to have references. And we have no disclosures. No. <laughs> you want to pay something, that would be great. <laughs> we get a little stipend for this. Um, anyway, we'll start with the case. And this is a home-based primary care case. I'm doing my rotation at the VA right now, so this case comes from that setting. It's a 75-year-old gentleman who um, has COPD. He's on four liters of oxygen. He is pretty much tethered by his oxygen. He has his house arranged so that he can get to the kitchen, get to the bathroom, get to his bedroom, which is all on the first floor, and his wife sleeps upstairs and basically doesn't leave the house. He is tethered by this oxygen. He has shortness of breath, very significant, profound shortness of breath with any kind of exertion in spite of having his oxygen. And, and really has these coughing spells that cause him a great deal of anxiety because he can't catch his breath. Um, he's had three hospitalizations in the past year, all COPD exacerbations, and most recently, after I come to visit him for the first time, he just had a, a, a trip to the emergency department, and luckily he was not admitted. They just gave him a short course of steroids, and he was feeling better the day that I came to visit him. Um, he got referred to palliative care by his, his primary care team, because you know they're thinking, this is getting bad. Maybe goals of care would be interesting to know about this gentleman, and maybe even think about end-of-life planning, um, and, and kind of work through all of this. His wife is there, um, although she didn't really participate, and the nurse is there with, the, with me doing the visit. So as you might expect, of course, his past medical history is remarkable for the COPD. Um, the other things are all the kind of bread and butter things that you might expect in an older gentleman. Um, really nothing terribly alarming on that. List, long list of medications, a lot of medications for um, his, he's maximally, maximally treated for his COPD by a pulmonologist who sees him about once a year, pretty much at the end of his rope. Um, his caregiving needs are not that great because he's done a remarkable job of setting up his living environment so that he can stay connected to his, his world. And he's actually, for somebody who's his age, he's remarkably connected through the computer. And he has his guitar right there with him, and he's able to do all the things that are meaningful to him. And he has a family that is very involved and engaged in his life who come to visit him. And it, to him, family was the most important thing. You know, so in our business, we always like to know what our patients, what their goals are, what's meaningful to them. And I was getting that sense from this gentleman that family was very important. And so long as he didn't have these coughing spells and feel anxious as a result of it, that his quality of life would be made a little bit better. His wife is the one who does all of the household chores. You know, it's the one that goes to do the grocery shopping. So he's actually pretty lucky that he has somebody in his life that can help him tend to his needs. Um, they've been married 53 years. They have six grown children, many grandchildren. They couldn't even tell me how many they had. Um, <laughs> you know, he had smoked and he quit five years ago. He had a significant uh, smoking history. And, it, and basically, not really a drinker, has a glass of wine whenever it's time to celebrate with his wife. And we always ask the question about any other drugs and there were no substance use disorders in this person's life. So has no pain. So unlike many patients that we might encounter in our practice, pain was not a per predominant symptom for him. It was really this dyspnea. Um, he described these coughing episodes that can happen completely randomly, but more consistently at nighttime when he's getting ready for bed. He feels like he gets very anxious when he's coughing. He also described an interesting phenomenon. He had a pulse ox on that he had available to him, and he he used the pulse ox, and he would watch the number go down, and he would get more anxious as he watched the number go down. And 
One of the nurses who came to see him astutely noticed that and said, stop looking at the pulse ox, put that away, don't go, don't look at it. And that did a lot to alleviate his anxiety, but he still had these coughing spells and they were actually uh, significant for other reasons because he felt like he could bring out whatever it was that was in there and then he felt better afterwards. The time that he couldn't do that was the time he went to the emergency room. He says he's not feeling, he's not, he's eating well, he's eating the way he normally would, no nausea, no vomiting, sleeps well, um, no other symptoms. He, he always, we always ask about constipation in his bowels and he says he has bowel movements once a day after he has his meal. So pretty regular guy. So, you know, we like to look at the palliative performance scale too. He's, of course, his ambulation is reduced. It's limited by his shortness of breath and the length of cord, uh, the length of his oxygen. He is unable to do most activity, but he is able to enjoy time on his computer. Um, he does require assistance for the uh, independent or the, you know, the grocery shopping and meal preparation, but he's able to get himself to the bathroom. And he's completely alert and pretty sharp for a gentleman with those kind of medical problems. So he kind of panned out at 40% on his palliative scale. His exam was unremarkable. He was a pretty thin gentleman. So as you might expect somebody who's pretty far along in their disease, he was thin. Um, vital signs were stable. Um, really, his lungs were very diminished, um, faint, faint and expiratory wheeze, but nothing terribly remarkable there and no edema or anything like that. So I'm talking to the gentleman. His, the nurse who sees him regularly did emphasize the anxiety that he has with his shortness of breath spells um, and, and really thought that maybe this gentleman would benefit from a, a low dose of morphine. Um, and for those of us who are familiar with treating dyspnea, um, it's not surprising to hear that morphine can be used for that. Respiratory so depression, yes, but not in the low doses. So, I left thinking, and of course this is a home visit, so I can't just write a prescription, have it given to the pharmacy. Um, there is a lovely system through the VA that will deliver the medications to the patient's home. So I'm not able to do any of this in real time. So we make arrangements to get all of the medications to the patient. I prescribed a naloxone um, kit to go with it because this is an opioid naive patient household and also prescribed um, <laughs> Senna for stools because anytime you prescribe the morphine, we always worry about the constipation. So that's how we left it. I said, we'll be, you know, we'd like to give this a trial, see how you do, and we'll go from there. So I go to see him two months later, and he hasn't started the morphine. And I kind of had a clue that this was going on because um, in follow up, he hadn't started it. He also had a visit with his pulmonologist over video conferencing, and I read the note and he discussed it with the pulmonologist who fully supported it and said, yes, you should take this because, you know, you're on the maximal dose. Please, this has the potential to help you. And he even described how to take it. But he still had the hesitation the patient has was, will this suppress my cough and keep me from coughing up that stuff? Yeah. Have you guys notice that when you're trying to introduce narcotics for kind of respiratory suppression, any kind of resistance from patients or families, what have some, been some of the strategies you guys have found that have worked there in language? With them. Not do it with them. But have them take the dose one for you, one for me. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that point of like we often have them try it in the hospital before they leave, we can yeah, do that outpatient as well with them. Yeah, it's right on your home business, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the fact that it really does help relieve the shortness of breath. And the shortness of breath is what really causes the anxiety. Um, that the feeling of not being able to breathe is, is a very, very tough one. And if you describe it as the, the way you prescribed it here for the dyspnea, rather than, oh, it's a pain med, it's, it's an opioid, it's bad. It's a, you know, it's really good for dyspnea. It's used in this case for dyspnea. And so they look at it as that and being able to label it as that sometimes helps break the stereotype. 
that's what I used to do. So muscle relaxant. Yes, that sort of thing. Like it just helps you relax. And the, and then low doses, like you said, saying saying that every time is super important. That at low doses, it does not. You know, it's really been a very effective in end stage CPN. It's shown it's shown to be very effective. So, so I was there with a nurse who knew the patient very well, mm -hmm. and she was able to say, when is the dyspnea most troubling to exactly. you? Exactly. And it was, we found out that it was really at bedtime. When he's watching television, he's all tucked in, he doesn't have to get up anymore, he'll have a coughing spell reliably. And that was another concern he had, is that it seemed pretty random, except that we found out not at bedtime. We couldn't really explain why it happened at bedtime, but bedtime was it. Any so we GERD said, issues? What's that? Did he have GERD issues? Good that. Um, well, he wasn't laying down because he was still sitting up. But he was changing your position from where you are in the right. rest of the day. Right. He didn't have it when he would sleep during the day, so he did take naps during the day. Yeah. So I think a lot of the patients with COPD mm -hmm. get a nocturnal anxiety because they're not convinced they're going to wake up in the morning ah. and they're scared of what's going to happen in the night yeah. and so sometimes uh, addressing that existential aspect of it will go a long way yeah um and i see that a lot that the yes. copd years have yeah. nocturnal anxiety Absolutely. the other thing that i'll do when i'm starting morphine or an opioid for cough or dyspnea I don't say the word morphine initially. I said, hey, we have this great medicine that's been around for 50 plus years. And, you know, it's really good for dyspnea. We use it all the time. Good idea. And by the way, it's called morphine. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's perfect. Yeah. So they, they start to listen, and then you can sort of push past the, oh my God, it's morphine. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. So I'm curious, he's not on like a low dose steroid in general? He has all of his inhaled. Um, and he has the steroids, steroid dose pack in case right. he has an exact. But sometimes I find some of these patients do better with a little low dose every day, um, and then they don't have these first yeah. as often. Um, but I've got a couple of people right now that that's what I've done, and they have now not had to have that big pack. Yeah. yeah. Have you noticed any trouble with fractures with that? No. Or issues with I mean, bone? keep in mind that these people are not long for sure. here anyways. Yeah. So I don't worry about that part. I look at more what's making them comfortable. How can I get them to where they need to be feeling like there's something um, and go from there? Because most of them are going to be about ready, that bridging process. They're getting ready to switch over, but they're not quite there yet. So he, he yes, would, go ahead. I would think that his pulmonologist would have started him on a steroid if he wanted to do it. It's funny how they there are many in the updated pulmonology guidelines. There's no real uh, criteria for having continuous systemic steroids unless they have not been able to be tapered off of pulse steroids for acute exacerbations. And so I've only seen it from a palliative aspect of. Do we think that steroids change something else about and how they? I think when you're looking at somebody like a pulmonologist or a specialist. They are looking at that person living forever, or at that person is not going to be dying. So therefore, they they're looking at maintaining that standard of care. They're not looking at the quality of life, and I don't mean that in any negative way. But they're not looking at the comfort measure. They're looking at here. This is the recipe for COPD, and I'm always going to make the recipe for COPD. You'd be the same way all the time. Okay. Yeah. Guidelines are looking at what five, ten year outcomes, exactly, rather than. Um, so we, you know, talk about it and he says, yes, I can do that. So he started taking the medication at nighttime, also told him to take the bowel med, um, along with it said, we can always back off of it, but you know, you don't want to get behind the curb. And he understood that he understood the naloxone was really for his wife's benefit. She understood how to use it. So I thought we were good. <laughs> um, so, and for a while, it seemed like he was doing okay. Um, and the morphine was starting to work. He was feeling more comfortable taking it at night. Um, but now he's having this intermittent nausea. He's not eating quite as much. Um, and after you get to the visit, you know that, you know, his last bowel movement was about six days ago. Um, and when you, like, get him to describe it, you know, it was this tiny little rabbit pellet. And so this is just your reminder that when you're prescribing opiates with one hand, with the other, you are prescribing your bowel reg. So, I went backwards. Don't do it. Um, all right. 
And so now we're in that period of we're, we're transitioning. Um, so we're several months down the road. He's in bed. His PO intake is pretty limited. It's soup, it's protein drinks, it's whatever his wife, who's kind of hovering over his bed, is like trying to get into this gentleman. Um, breathing is more labored. Um, and so the dose and the frequency of the morphine is going up, but we're still not getting there. Um, and so this has been the team decided that, you know, Ativan is probably a good option at this point. Um, and wanted to kind of pull a room and see kind of when do you guys add that second agent? How much morphine is he on at this point? What? How much morphine is he actually taking right now? Um, this is a made-up case. Uh, let's <laughs> see. <laughs> this part was made up. So now we can fast forward to those patients that I've had in the inpatient hospice unit. Um, and the morphine was less important than the, the Ativan that might have been given at, at that point. So we've transitioned from a palliative case where he's actively being treated by the pulmonologist and being managed maximally to, well, now there's really, they've kind of washed their hands of it. And he's, somebody has, a nice social worker has come and made the case for transitioning to hospice because sometimes that's challenging. Five milligrams every two hours. <laughs> so, I mean, that would really I mean, on. putting him on an MS cotton. Yes. Which yeah. would sometimes might help. Right. Sometimes. Yeah. May, may not. Mm -hmm. um, give him a little bit longer and less use of liquid morphine, right. possibly. Because it was liquid that, at first because it was a PRN dose that we But he is slow gut, so, I mean, that's the only other issue with that. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes out of end when you see that the patient is feeling short of breath because the anxiety of that, right, that right. gets kicked off right. by feeling yeah. that they can't yeah, breathe. Sort of the anxiety creates a sensation of shortness of breath and then you can calm the whole thing down. I know Dr. Brown used to do that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> can I stop passing notes? <laughs> we do it everybody, everybody does it different. Uh, there's no right or wrong on it. Yeah. In yeah. practice, at least when I was inpatient, um, I saw right off the bat a lot of times the morphine, low dose morphine and low dose Ativan for an end stage COPD exactly. patient were added together right at the beginning. Because, you know, they're obviously both very effective and they're actually synergistically effective. Yes. So um, they really seem to like, if as, you know, you stay with lowest dose as possible, but together they work so well together that I often saw it prescribed together. Do, do you do that in your practice? I'm too simplistic. I okay. can't really start with one start and, with one and the move next, on. but I have yeah. a very low threshold to yeah. add the next one. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing, there's some research that shows that long-acting morphine is better for dyspnea than short-acting because you get an on-off effect from the short-acting. And so if people are tolerating a few doses of the, the um, short-acting, they may be better off transitioning fairly quickly to MS con. The first thing that came to my mind was, does he need to go inpatient for med titration? Yeah, is that like you could do this good at home if you have Great. a good hospice nurse. Great. Okay. I guess I was curious too. I don't know um, if you guys talk about this later. You can tell me to shut up. But there, are, there are other things besides meds that can be. Well, I think my bet this guy who's a veteran and whatever. There may be some psychosocial sure. components to this that have not been reached like, upon. Like, is he stressed because he's causing his, like, he's bedbound now? Is he he's causing lost his, 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 his wife? Things. His wife is and more dependent, you know. Has he been able to talk And to if she's hovering, that hovering feeling can make a short, a COPD or be very short of breath. Yeah. Also, yeah. if he is, he was in the military. Yes. Sometimes a, ben, um, a benzodiazepine can be disinhibiting. It can actually cause a little bit of PTSD right. flare, so you, you know, want to be careful. Um, and so we're a little bit more or farther down the road and he's, he's not responding anymore. Um, he's kind of fully transitioned now and his wife made him a promise that she's going to keep him at home. Like he is never going to go to any kind of facility and wanted to kind of talk about things that we would do, um, kind of non-pharmacologically and then other ways we can keep him at home, um, with these medications. There's any thoughts. That's that's where your hospice team comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, they're the ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the things we did want to talk about, um, this room probably knows a lot about it, um, but it's something that I did not know about until fellowship. And this is a Maisie catheter. And so when patients um, when patients can't 
take in oral medications. We're going to do a little show and tell. Uh, we, we can pass it around. There we go. It's, it's this catheter that, for lack of a better way to put it, it kind of works like an NG tube, but rectally. Um, so it's, would someone put it differently? Well, first of all, liquid morphine is fine yeah. when they're dying. As a hospice nurse, yeah. that's how we did it, and it works very effectively. I've done clysis before, which is taking a butterfly, but you can't, no longer can get injectables in the state of Maine or anywhere else. So that no longer works as a, you know, anyway. But that was a tool that I used 12 years ago, was to do clysis and provide medication that way. But the oral root is still there. He, may, he doesn't need to swallow, and that's the education that again comes from the nurse or the provider that they don't need to swallow. This is a, absorbed to the buccal cavity. You can effectively medicate them that way. If you can get a high enough uh, you can get double, You can get concentrates from certain to, pharmacies. Yeah, you have to get a compound. You have to get a and compound. You can still do clysis with, um, as a diazepam. There's one of them that you can yes, still Yes, Valium, get. you can yeah. get. And you can get from New England Life Care. But yeah, um, but yeah so there's ways... You can do it rectally. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a mucous membrane. Totally. It's a really vascular area. Exactly. Um, and there, so, the, are there other medications you would want? MS to call that can be rectally. For though, for his comfort, like things he might need to stay on. Yeah. So not necessarily this gentleman, but there are patients who may need like a seizure medication or right. something like well, that. That can be Valium suppository. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is one where it only goes in about a few inches. Um, so it doesn't go in very far, and the patients don't often feel it. Um, but if they're constipated, how effective is that? And if you have someone who hasn't been doing that? If there's a stool ball or if there's any kind of rectal mass, those are kind of your contraindications. You can't get it in the area. Um, but you can have bowel movements around it, and it's if it comes out, it's not a sterile procedure. It can just go right back in. You don't need another one. So it, it's not a tool that is oft reached for, but I feel like it's a relatively unknown one, um, that if the patient is bound and determined to be in their home, it's an option that you can use. It was new to me, and I feel like it was turned to, and it was like painful to turn patients for rectal suppositories and things. So like that caused more distress or more discomfort. So this, there was no need for turning. I feel like that was the benefit. What? Generally speaking, when they're on hospice, they were plan we're planning for them to stay in their home. Correct. We wouldn't go, they wouldn't go to the hospital. Right. right. I was thinking inpatient hospice yeah, was kind no. of, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. But yes. Okay. You can get inpatient hospice. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. We have 15 minutes. We'll see it to the other crew. Okay. So Thank that was you. ours. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank you. you. So we are, we, we focus less on the patient scenario and more on the general interventions. So we, we kind of did a little bit of a case. But then we move on to what, you know, what you do generally. So, yeah, bear with us with a little bit different. So um, our patient, really basic. So super straightforward, heart failure patient, someone in their 70s, our 72-year-old woman, um, has been having progressive dyspnea, which we also kind of covered, uh, weakness and loss of appetite. Looking at past medical history, coronary artery disease, has been stented, should have been a DES. I would like to change that. Um, so it's been a few years since they had a stent. Sorry about that. Um, basic hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and then uniquely, not uniquely actually, but also diabetes um, with neuropathy. Some kidney disease and then... Um, Heart failure with a re reduced ejection. Reduced CF, yeah. <laughs> um, meds there that you would expect to see mostly with heart failure. Um, and then the insulin for diabetes. Just briefly, knowing that there are multiple categories of heart failure, which certainly will affect the medications that the patient needs, um, we will just skip through this guy to get to our symptoms. Sure. So, symptoms with heart failure. Uh, frequently, dyspnea. 92% of patients with CHF report dyspnea. Um, you'll see it in the forms of orthopnea. Uh, you know, short of breath when they're trying to do their daily activities or anything above and beyond, um, hypoxemia, and uh, of course, the degree of intensity of symptoms correlates with the extent of the disease in the patient. 
The interventions uh, that you can use are opioids, similarly to uh, COPD, morphine sulfate. Um, so you can do 20 milligrams daily. Uh, it can also help to reduce anxiety, which um, they will often experience when they're short of breath, right? And supplemental O2 if they're hypoxemic. You can also, and we didn't really jump on it here, but you have to look at the etiology of their dyspnea. So if it's also volume overload, you're going to want to address that in its own right. Yeah. Do you guys have anything to add? Because uh, you, sh I probably do. <laughs> I'm guessing. Did we cover what you guys do for your heart failure patients? And this is assuming they're like maximally treated for their heart failure. Yeah. So now we're coming in after that's already occurring and we're trying to help with Symptoms that already exist or continue to exist despite that. I guess not. Well, you're looking at, I mean, you kind of reducing some meds if need be. Yeah. Um, and they're not on a lot. Well, but they're on cholesterol meds. Yeah. You know, they're they're on metropolis tartrate only once a day, not twice a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. Isn't that interesting? Agreed. Um, so that's that's something else. Um, you know, but yeah. try to clean up, get rid of and stuff. And we do, we do talk good. about the diabetes meds when that, where that's concerned, too, mm -hmm. as we get into that part. So, yeah, absolutely. Always, always trimming down the medications when you can. All right. Then we also see fatigue. I mean, we all know this is a pretty universal symptom when people have heart failure. Uh, interestingly, in the study that we were looking at, it's most common in females, especially if they're frail and have depression. I guess you can extrapolate that from our general population of any group of people. Um, frailty and depression, I think, chicken or the egg, right? So you're gonna see decreased activity tolerance, more time in chair or bed. This goes back to the palliative performance score and you know fits right in with the things that you're gonna be assessing in a palliative visit. This stuff is hard, it's often refractory. There's not a lot to do. So you're just managing other symptoms related to heart failure and then trying to offload stressors or provide support for those activities that are now unable to be accomplished with, due to the debilitating fatigue. Yeah, so you know when we're having our conversations with our patients, like what gives your life meaning? If it's getting out into the barn and working you know, on wood, woodworking projects, then you figure out how to get a ramp to the barn, you know, facilitate them being able to do those things as part of a way to alleviate their depression. Um, always, always good to do. Kind of adding to that is their, not really belief, their perception of themselves as someone who is now differently able than they were at a different point in their life. I feel like for me, that's how, as a clinician, I feel most successful treating fatigue in people with heart failure because it's a lot of like, well, cool, you can, okay, so you garden and how do you get there? And they're like, well, I have to stupidly take a break at this bench. And I'm like, well, it's really cool you have that bench. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they're not, that is not the same as they were able to do it. And so some of it is like, do their family talk about it that way? Do they have their people in their life cut them out with things because they just won't take the time to give them that break or to walk slower with them? Or like, what is the other adapting to the fatigue part? Um, is their partner sitting next to them and repeatedly saying, yeah, this isn't exactly. the Susan I know. Exactly. This isn't Susan yeah. anymore. And I can actually see it. And you have to kind of help them reframe. Yeah. This is still Susan. Susan can still do these things. Yes. And Susan's a person. <laughs> Stop <laughs> saying that. So, yeah, reframing is really important. Yep. Pain. So this was interesting to me, honestly, is pain is, is a pretty uh, universal symptom, again, with heart failure patients. And it's kind of generalized, not necessarily cardiogenic. Um, and of course, you know, when we're thinking about pain, we think about the other um, domains, spiritual, um, psychosocial pain, what we were just kind of touching on. Who am I anymore? What, what do I bring to the table anymore? Um, it can present differently. It could be whole body pain, um, existential, it can be an organ. You know, we might be dealing with somebody who has um, weeping sores on their legs because of their venous stasis ulcers, and that's painful. Um, claudication, gout, which we treat differently. Um, we're not getting into that right now. Uh, interventions, again, this pain is often refractory, like the fatigue, but um, opioids can do that double duty, right? They can help reduce the dyspnea, they can help relax the patient, and they can help treat 
whatever pain that patient might be going, going through. And then we turn to our social work chaplain crew to really help us with that spiritual and psychosocial stuff because as we've heard today in here and other ways, um, we can really help people through pain or other symptoms by figuring out the source and trying to help with that to uh, work on the symptom. Uh, depression, this, these all kind of fit together, right? So fatigue, depression, pain, all these things come with their loss of autonomy. Um, so clinically significant depression happens in about 22% of heart failure patients. Um, and it all comes with their in, um, level of function as they lose their level of function, increase in depression. Um, when you have clinically, uh, clinically significant depression, though, it's very much linked to poor survivorship survivorship, um, and increase in all-cause mortality. So um, this is, the, I feel like, part of the basis of, as palliative care doctors, what we're doing is we're trying to get to the heart of people, knowing that it affects all these other um, physiologic things. You might have a patient who doesn't take their meds, so then their symptoms get worse, and they're not doing it because they're depressed. Um, they're less physically active because they're depressed, and then they become unable to be as physically active, so it becomes circular. And then some withdrawal are with, you know, removing themselves from things that used to make them happy. Uh, interventions, depending on um, how long you think they have to live or what you're looking for, will very much affect what you're going to treat with. So SSRIs, you're going to need a longer life expectancy to have, allow them to um, do their best work. Uh, importantly, with heart disease, avoiding tricyclics, I feel like this is something we, we all know, but it's a good reminder every time to, to know that we're not going to use our tricyclics in this setting. I would also add that SSRI is the citalopram, and escitalopram are the most QT prolonging, and so if that's a concern for your patient, we don't use those. All right, cognitive impairment. They get dull. Um, it's, it happens frequently. It can be, you know, acute on chronic. It can be just, you know, acute delirium. Um, it can be progressive. Um, when, when you're seeing that sort of loss of cognitive function, you have worse outcomes. You can see right here, um, the increased hospital length of stay and rehospitalization, which we get dinged for, so we don't want. Um, and they're not going to do as well in general. Um, you can see it in all kinds of ways, uh, disruptions in their speech, uh, processing, attention, memory, learning, and executive function, and we therefore want to be looking ahead when we have our um, congestive heart failure patients to have these conversations earlier before they before they start to progress. And we we don't want to be doing um, our paperwork with them to talk about their goals of care when they can't keep the thread, you know? And that's always sad when that happens because it's really hard on the family. So I think the lesson to take from this is this could happen, have that conversation, do that paperwork, talk to the family, talk to the patient um, early in the course of illness, whatever possible. And then social care, we know that um, socioeconomic disadvantage definitely contributes to the risk of having cardiovascular disease or the uh, degree of cardiovascular disease, so again, taking into account the whole patient. And another point where our social work can be so, so helpful, um, so turn to them to help with this as well. And this person had type 2 diabetes, so we want to talk about that. When it comes to the end of life, um, you know, they become more at risk for hypoglycemia. We don't want that. So we kind of raise the level of um, blood glucose that we're comfortable with. You know, um, different resources say different things, but 270 upwards to 360, um, you don't need to do A1Cs anymore. It doesn't matter. Um, and you're going to st stop insulins if they're on insulins. If they're on um, oral agents, you can even have the oral agents to get them to a point where they're, you know, metformin doesn't usually cause hypoglycemia, but some of the other ones can. And so you want to make sure that you're titrating those so that the patient isn't becoming hypoglycemic at any point. Um, and when it gets down to days, you just stop it all. You know, just treat their thirst. Um, give them a urinary catheter if there's polyuria. Make them comfortable. But, you know, you can, you can really start looking at, like, really tamping down the expectations of the uh, diabetic control when they get close to death. 
And I think I did. Oh, we don't have any. What's up? We're, we're, I just got a five minute warning. Okay, we're Sorry. done. <laughs> no, no, we don't have any. You're not making any money for this. No. Again, we'll take donations. Yeah. <laughs> So I think we have like five minutes left in our breakout session, and we knew there was a lot that we ended up not being sure how to break these cases into. So I'm going to give you guys two options. I can kind of quickly go through like our case structure and the, the kind of high learning points that we were going to touch on, or I can leave uh, room for a couple of questions, and I can send out basically our outline and what we were going to talk about with the notes that they're sending out for the conference anyway. The short version, Cosmina would like to prove that I did something. That's fine. <laughs> okay. I, does most people have paper? Okay. If you don't have paper, I have a pad of paper for you. Because back in another life, I used to be a teacher, and I didn't always like the presentation mode. So I used to make my students write down or draw whatever they thought was pertinent from what I was saying. Um, and so the, the patient we're going to talk about is Henry. He's an 83-year-old gentleman who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, you are kind of seeing him in whatever setting that you would like to imagine yourself in, because I kind of want to see what you guys think is important to know about Henry right now. He was diagnosed about uh, two to three years ago um, with Alzheimer's. Uh, he was initially brought to his primary care with his wife and his daughter, who remain involved. Um, they're concerned now that he's been eating less and becoming distracted around his meals. He's still really social with them, but just isn't taking in as much. They've been prompting him to eat, um, but he's been picking at his food, and his wife is really worried about him. So what would you guys like to know further about Henry? I know the participation point. <laughs> you can do it. You've been doing it this whole time. Yes? How does he take his medication? So he takes most of his medications in the morning. He has a couple of nighttime meds. He's not having any difficulty swallowing them. His wife does a pill box for him. Their daughter brings and picks up his medications for them and so has a kind of an extra person checking on that. He's not getting too many meds all the time. She checks the pill boxes occasionally. Um, most of his medications, if you'd like to know those, which I prepped in advance for you, metoprolol succinate, which he's only taking once a day, uh, lisinopro, uh, he's on an aspirin of vitamin D, hydrochlorothiazide, docusate as needed, and levothyroxine. Falls, weight loss? He has had a little bit of weight loss when you start to look back at his vitals. No falls. He does use a cane or a walker to get around the house, depending on how he's feeling. Um, and they haven't seen anything that makes them think that his way of getting around the house is different. He's not doing more furniture surfing. He's not changed where he goes in the house. What's his blood pressure doing? His blood pressure is okay, but it's not phenomenal. It's in the 100 over 80s when you look back. So why are we on metropolis succinate? Perfect question. <laughs> yes. So definitely there's some med management things that we can do. So let's assume you're all very smart and you appropriately recognize that you can down titrate a lot of his blood pressure meds, probably get him off of his hydrochlorothiazide and his lysanopril, which leave him at risk for electrolyte issues, especially now that he's not eating and drinking as much. Anything else you'd like to know? Psychosocially, how is the family doing? How is the patient doing? Is he anxious? Is he agitated? Yeah, he didn't notice that he wasn't eating as much. Okay. He's like, they brought me here. They're upset about it. I don't know. Uh, but his wife is is sees his eating and the way that they shared meals together over their lifetime as a very distressing thing to her and that he used to really enjoy her cooking. Is he upset or anything like that? It's much more of the social meal is a way of showing that she loves him and all of these integrating him into the family eating meals She's just worried that she's losing that connection with him. So he's lost a little bit of weight. He's lost about five pounds over the last, like, four months or so, um, but nothing really significant. Let's say he's a average-sized person. Plan for the future. Plan for the future. So kind of talking with Henry, his wife, you kind of normalize some of the conversations around food and eating and how he's getting his meals. And right now he's not really losing weight, but we're going to keep a little bit of closer eye. And their plan for the future. Yes. So they want to keep him at home as long as they can keep him safe. I don't know if there's specific other questions you want to have for his... Well, I was looking at whether or not they want him to keep him at home. Does he qualify for the VA, maybe have support? He doesn't services. have any what other like military service that I can use. That can help her because as a caregiver for somebody who's declining, they need to take care of her too. Yes. So where's that? So daughter lives locally. They have a cousin who's been willing to spend some time and alleviate wife if she needs to run errands and things like that. They have other family support they can draw on. They don't have any military resources to draw on. He just wasn't in active service. Um, they do have a church that they go to that has sort of a, a program where they could have a volunteer come out intermittently and do those sorts of things. 
in advanced directives? They already have advanced directives because you're a very annoying primary care and you made them do it every five years and update them. <laughs> so his power of attorney is his wife, his backup is his daughter, um, and those are the people who remain involved in his life. Yeah. For, for the immediate time, so that she feels less guilty or more involved, they could talk about his favorite foods and she could... Absolutely. So they, they start to, like, she still gets to talk with him while she eats breakfast, and you normalize a lot of that. Even if he's not eating as much, she's still able to go through that process with him. Absolutely. So we've addressed some of his meds, which, you know, some of your meds may not make you feel great necessarily. Um, I don't know of necessarily any off the top of the bat besides really his metoprol that might have been making, you know, contributing to any of his appetite things. Um, and since he doesn't feel any distress about his appetite, um, you know, I was hoping for someone, but no one took that bait, to bring up, you know, do you want to start a medication, even though we were very nice people and we decreased a lot of his meds. Yes? Before you go there, I want to know their understanding of his disease. Right. Yeah. So they don't have a ton of experience with anyone else who's had progressive uh, dementias or progressive memory the issues. The never spelled this out, though, right? No. No, 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 no. Of course not. Let's not go there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so waiting for a referral. Yeah, so wait, it's an 18-month waiting list, so yeah, we can well, keep going on that. Thanks for former yeah. neurologist. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm teasing my former neurologist. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so you, as, you know, you're following up on all these med titrations and things, you should definitely be bringing in what are next steps, what are immediate next steps versus what are things that we should consider now as to what our brain might want to do in the future for Henry. Um, and then I actually had a continuing part where, you, you know, you're seeing them over the next couple of months, and now he has lost oh, quite a bit more weight. Um, and his getting around the house has changed because he's not really eating as much, and he's not as social with them around meals anymore. And some of his temperament is just a little bit different. He's more agitated when he is not really understanding where the process is going or what he needs to be doing at that moment. Um, and he has started to have some episodes right before bedtime where he gets acutely confused. Um, and so a lot of that correctly in the next part was our education of the family and our support for them as his caregiving needs change because they might have had a specific understanding of keeping him at home when he was first diagnosed and in the initial progression, and then things change. So I'm going to leave it as that, and I will send the rest of the notes that we had. We were going to talk about the fast and some staging and talking with the 12. family. You have until 12, 12, 15. 15. Okay. okay. Good. Great. Then that was on me. <laughs> so... One of the ways that we um, were referencing was just it's hard for family to sometimes understand what their access to resources is, even when their situation with their family member has really, really changed. And it's hard in terms of getting hospice into the home to support this family that wants to keep their family member at home when their moment when they might need the most resources might come earlier than when they meet hospice criteria for those services. And so that was what the FAST... Sometimes going through that, I can talk both about the process of Alzheimer's as it progresses and touching on each stage, giving examples for family, what might be hard for them, what resources I would like to set them up with, or what things that they might think is hardest for their family member. So Henry's temperament things come with some of his loss of independence, his inability to do a lot of things for himself. But it's also his way of relating to his family has changed because he's not always sure why they're there as his disease progresses. Um, so one of the things that I was going to touch on was his delirium management. Shoot out your favorite preference for delirium management for my gentleman. Family. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> uh, change the environment so that, or talk to them about changing the environment or the way they approach things. Yeah, for sure. Um, then sometimes you have to play with it. You try one, doesn't work. You try a different one. So I had a really great family medicine mentor who called. She said, you always have to know what your first placebo medication is, where you're like, oh, this might work, and then always have, like, sort of plan B. So what's the med you're most comfortable with to, like, start first off the bat for delirium management for this gentleman who's otherwise doing okay? Sundowning. Yeah. Seroquel. Okay, so we got a Seroquel. <laughs> no one wants to fight her on the Seroquel? <laughs> no one. Yeah. Okay, for Sparadome. I knew I could count on that one at least. Lanzolivic, right? they're losing weight. Great. Lanzolivic, they're losing weight. I would try to find out why they're but I mean, I think some of it is obviously in Alzheimer's, but there's other acute causes for different. Like sure. So let's make sure we haven't missed something. Let's say we did our due diligence and this okay. is a test question. 
It is not acutely altered from any other cause. It's just because of his disease course. Okay. okay. Yes. So I, I think we got like our, our first three right. Those we have our quetiapine, we have our lansipine, and we have our asparadone, which are very titratable and ranges, have a couple of different ways you can get them into people, which are fantastic. Okay. So in terms of since I'm I know that we're all smarter in the audience that we received, but the general guidelines that we got for palliative care one-on-one, I did want to talk about some of the appetite and nausea components of that. You know, is there another reason that his appetite has changed? Let's assume again we're very smart and we figured out that it's not. It's related to the disease process. And then medications that often we might have trialed in this person, they probably are not going to have that much of a benefit given that it's his underlying disease process that's contributing. And adding back to his pill burden is really not what we would want to do in this situation. Um, but remembering that things like mirtazapine have a different dose for mood than they do for helping with an appetite stimulant. Um, and so that's another component. Is his, has his appetite changed as a precursor because of this mood that then developed into this sundowning effect? Um, and also just providing some support to the family that that's both a normal thing and not something that they've done wrong that has changed, of course. Maybe talk about um, an ass you know, a maximum assessment or whatever you need yeah. to do to see if they need to get care in the home at that point. Absolutely. It's exhausting care caregiver burden. It is exhausting. A lot yeah. in the demented patient. Definitely. All right, I'm going to leave it there for right now. Any questions with anything that we've mentioned for our three patient cases to try and introduce some symptoms? And at what point, and I know it's very case by case, do you think that it's appropriate to stop, let's say, the RCEP and Amenda? That oh, I think it's appropriate very early. Yeah. Um, but I recognize that I... So I read a really great book uh, last year, uh, which I've recommended to Cosmina. It's called Understanding Alzheimer's. It's by a gentleman who was a geriatrician at the uh, Penn State, actually, and was himself diagnosed with Alzheimer's and wrote about some of his understanding as a physician who knew where his disease was going, but also looking back on the research that got to the current medications. Um, and that book really prompted me to go back and look at a lot of the studies. Um, and a lot of them have very interesting caveats for their patient panel that they collected that data on. Um, in another life, besides the teaching thing, I uh, was a math modeler and uh, basically data. So like, how well did you do your statistical data for your trials? Uh, and so it was very interesting to go back and read those trials to look at the quality of data. And from my conclusion, it's not great, uh, even lower than I was previously attributing it. Um, and really, it requires identification at a level that's very difficult, depending on what your initial presenting symptom of dementia is. Um, and you're often, by the time you're clinically recognizable or brought to a clinician for evaluation, much further along in that disease process than any of these sort of studies looked at, or even I love a good patient-centered outcome. Not many of these trials looked at a patient-centered outcome as well. So I often talk to family members fairly early that if there's really any meds or any burden of pills, that's usually one of the first ones I'm recommending to stop. Um, but I encourage everyone to kind of look at that and just, yeah, decide for yourself. So that little cause is weight loss. So if I see patients losing weight, significantly, then I, that's an indication I would stop it for. The other thing, if you look at when you would stop them is if patients lose all but maybe two of their basic activities of daily living, it's time to stop them. So if they no longer can dress themselves, can feed themselves, cannot toilet themselves, cannot uh, whatever, bathe themselves, then uh, it, it's time to stop it. Has anyone seen hyperactivity or like a rebound effect with stopping it? Because I was definitely reading about, I mean, that's what I was reading about related to it, that there are times when you don't want to stop it. Yeah, I saw yes, so at least one yes. They regress, so some of them do, so that's why you, you, you'd keep yeah, them until they, they really... Yeah, yeah. 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 And how, like, I don't know the rate of tapering. That also was super variable in everything I read. Some were, I mean, it, depending on the situation, whether you're in hospice or where we work. I'm just curious what the experience is, because the taper, I thought, would take longer than their life expectancy sometimes. I would say doses higher than 10 on the donepazil are not really recommended, because you don't really see any benefit with the higher doses. So if they're on 10, 
then it's not so hard to taper down. Thanks. Some of them self taper. True. Yeah. 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 You never know what they taste. Yes. <laughs> My favorite taper is the one where the family goes, "Oh, we stopped that." Yeah. 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 What are you even talking about? Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I, I had made a like a sheet uh, when I was in the end of residency where I looked at basically like oh, these are commonly meds I want to stop in the office. What are ways that I will have a quick reference sheet for myself to stop them? And so I think just kind of knowing like what's in your wheelhouse and commonly in your wheelhouse and having some way that you have a resource for it is just the, the best way forward with that. I feel like there's sometimes a lot of emotional attachment to the to Nefisil families. Like yes. this is the medication that is like, and so I think talking to them early about that, yeah. like they were saying, and like planting the seeds, it's like when we reach this stage, mm -hmm. then it's time, um, rather than kind of coming up to the end and it's like, this isn't gonna help anymore. And it's yep. the family just clings to it. Yes. That's a very good point. And I think yeah. also what you were alluding to is it's important to say early that nobody can do this alone at home, that there will come a time when they need either more help in the home, which is already difficult for families to accept, or for the patient to go to a nursing facility. But if you do say, even if the patient is not present for that, just in a separate meeting with the family, it helps them uh, along the way, because it's so hard, that transition, when you have to place your loved one in a nursing home. Because you don't just lose the, the connection with your loved one, you use your role as their primary caregiver, and it's a big loss for caregivers. I've worked with a couple of family members as well for making the sorts of like um, photo books that are often used in like memory wards and nursing homes because I did a lot of my like pre-medical school training in hospitals that had memory wards, which are not in Maine, uh, but was in Michigan. Um, and so seeing like those sort of things, sometimes families having the ability to do that over a longer period of time. I feel like that was helpful as a primary care doc, um, which I'm excited to go back to do eventually. But yeah. Okay, I'm gonna sit down. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any last questions or words of wisdom so far? <laughs> I, I, I think um, one of the things that's important is there is a sense of loss for families. You know, someone was saying, well, this isn't Sue. And in some ways it is Sue, but in some ways it's not Sue. And I think that holding that um, sort of ambiguous sense of who someone is and how they've changed is important to acknowledge. That sort of in, ambiguous loss stuff, I think. And I also just in general think, you know, talking with families early on about what they can expect. Um, it's just always helpful just paying attention to, you know, not stressing them out. Um, mm -hmm. Because too much information can be hard too, but I think both of those things can be really helpful. And that speaks to the whole the first thing we have to do when we walk into the room with the patient and with his family, which is establish a relationship and build trust. So that you you kind of if you if you have your feelers out, hopefully we all have a pretty good ability to feel out of you know the people we're talking to. We gauge how much you're ready to hear. We ask them, how much are you ready to hear? Like, what do you want to know? What don't you want to know? And those sort of conversations, those very uh, direct conversations, and also that very good, uh, that, that paying attention to all the cues, I think can be really helpful in making sure that you're communicating effectively with taking care of. Without that, you, you, you're lost. So it is now 12.15. <laughs> I would like everyone, well, you can tell the laundry. Um, but I would like everyone to be able to get food and all that fun stuff. Um, and it sounds like Dr. Brenker will have some sort of table discussion points, but um, let us know if you have any additional thoughts. Thank you. 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 Thank you.